book will make you first completely hate humanity and then kind of fall in love with it. This book will make you chase pain and this one will make you want to ignore and completely deny it. This book will make you fiery passionate while this one will make you completely detached. There is so much both emotional and intellectual power contained in books but I've found that specifically reading philosophy books over the last few years has genuinely changed my brain and the way that I approach life, the way that I think and see myself and the world and so today I wanted to share four main ways that reading philosophy books has changed me as a person. Number one is lessening my anxiety through having a free perspective shift in the world and what I mean by this is that for example if you have ever been on a flight away from your hometown and you've looked out of the window down to the city and you can see basically everything or if you've gone high up in the mountains and you've looked down at the city have you ever had this feeling of kind of perspective changing where you go I can't believe that in just this tiny little space this is where I've had so much anger so much pain so many tears so much rejection so much fear so much desire so much love so many things have happened and once you're so far away from it and you look down at it it kind of feels almost so much smaller and insignificant and I always have had this feeling of going I can't believe that I've gone through so much pain for no reason. It's all contained in this tiny space and it makes no sense. And I feel as though this is beautifully captured in one of my favourite paintings, which is the Enchanted Castle, which kind of shows this moment of this lady who's left the castle to think. And I think that all the issues that she might be facing within the walls kind of completely change when you're far away. And this is why we have this instinct, I think, to want to move or detach whenever we're going through a lot of pain or a breakup or any sort of loss. But this sort of physically removing yourself from a situation or looking down at the situation physically is so difficult, expensive, and sometimes impossible. If you're having 3 a.m. terrible thoughts, you don't really have the option of just going to the top of a mountain and looking down and to gain this like immediate perspective shift. But I feel as though through reading philosophy, I've kind of gained the ability to do this just mentally to myself. So for example, one of my favorite philosophers, Michael Allen Singer, talks a lot about this ability to kind of step out of yourself and look at the person who's experiencing your life rather than always being in that first person view all the time. And he describes this, for example, when he says, and here comes this moment and the next and the next and the next. And what he's describing here is this ability to gain perspective and look at what's happening to you rather than experiencing it, which can be a very valuable thing to do, especially when you're in a lot of pain. This ability to be completely detached, not just from the things around you, but to be able to sometimes be detached from yourself is so liberating when you need it. Again, Michael Singer said, the more you let the world just be something you're aware of, the more it would let you be who you are. This ability to almost gain perspective immediately is something that so many philosophers have described and reading a lot about it and as these are the types of books that I will reread two, three, four, five different times and I just want to get this message in me as well as possible and this perspective shift has been absolutely life-changing in lessening my anxiety when I need it. The second philosophy books have changed my brain is that they've shown me what true freedom looks like and this freedom of thought that you have in philosophy is like absolutely nothing else. I remember the first time I read Nietzsche, Nietzsche, Nietzsche? Nietzsche. And I think it was the genealogy of morals or beyond good and evil. And I remember being utterly shocked and thinking, oh my God, are we allowed to say this? Is he, is this okay? How can we do this? But then the more and more I read about it, the more I thought that it was so entertaining, so fun and so liberating. The thing about philosophy is that the only rules are mathematical rules. So things just need to adhere to logic. So they need to make sense so that we can all kind of understand what the other person is saying. But beyond that, you can say absolutely anything. Your deepest, darkest thoughts, you can say out loud. You can question them. You can ask other people about them everything absolutely everything is encouraged to be said and to be spoken and it's so 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 beautiful it's almost a celebration of all the different things that the human mind can come up with and will collaboratively discuss them attack them support them just chat about them recognizing that this is just an intellectual conversation and this is so 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 much fun Nietzsche himself said I am one things and my writings are another and this ability to distinguish the things that we say and the things that we think and the things that we are considering from ourselves is so 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 important this made me realize and appreciate that we are not our thoughts because those things change all the time and we are not our opinions because again these are so malleable and it's so liberating to realize that everything that we've ever experienced or thought or seen or done is just not who we are and we have the ability to constantly change this and we should be able to discuss these whenever we want. In philosophy I think things have very little consequences and they are praised and celebrated just for existing and for promoting conversation and for kind of helping us live our lives in a more entertaining way. The next and very important way that my brain has changed is recognizing that it cannot be 
trusted and I should definitely not trust myself and my own thoughts. Richard Feynman very famously said, the first principle is that you must not fool yourself and you are the easiest person to fool. It's actually quite shocking how untrustworthy our own minds are and how much we trust them at the same time. So for example, if we take the voice in our heads that we identify with and externalize it for a moment and imagine that yourself is a close friend of yours and this close friend has been giving you advice your whole life. This friend has been telling you who to date, has been telling you who to like, who not to like, what people think about you, what job you should take, what you should eat, what you should do. All this advice has been given from this external person. Then the question is, how often are they right? Because in my case, for example, I am very, very wrong. The ways that I think people think about me, the ways that I think I think about people, the feelings and thoughts I have always change all the time. And I give myself some really, really bad advice sometimes. So if I was a friend and I next gave myself advice, I would probably go, mm, I'm not sure if I can trust you. Or if I had hired someone to be my advisor or my consultant and that person was myself, they would be fired definitely because their track record is not too good. Now, this is not to say that I think we should not trust our minds and should rather hire someone else to do things for us. This is not what I'm saying, but I think just recognizing that ourselves are not that trustworthy and just keeping this in mind in the background is very informative but also very liberating in a way. Eckhart Tolle for example said that I am never upset for the reasons that I think I am and I think there's this huge realization in philosophy that we are separate from ourselves and that our minds change and cannot be trusted. I think it's very liberating to see my life in the way that I'm constantly changing and I strongly feel things that obviously will change and that I'm in a constant state of flux and I'm just as good at judging myself and judging others than others are at judging me and judging themselves. I don't know why um, I'm sometimes functioning under the assumption that I somehow have this better view of the world than other people have around me, which doesn't make any sense. I think we're all on the same footing. And I think through philosophy, you also realize that people have always been the same and they've been just as changing and untrustworthy to themselves as they are right now. Even reading early philosophers 3,000, 2,000, 1,000 years ago, they're facing the same issues, the same concerns, the same problems that we have today. And it's so amazing to be able to resonate fully with what they're saying and realizing that we really just haven't changed in nature almost at all. And not only that, not only have our internal instincts always remained the same, but the way that we view the world has completely shifted. So for example, Nietzsche recognized that all good things were once bad things. Every original sin becomes an original virtue. And realizing just how much we've changed our minds throughout humanity on so many core essential values and virtues shows that no rules or opinions or thoughts or judgments are really set in stone. The only thing that remains constant are our natural instincts and the way that we adapt and adjust to them is constantly changing. And that adaptation and judgment just cannot be trusted. So I think this approach of viewing myself as being sometimes very untrustworthy is very, very liberating and kind of takes the pressure off a lot. The thoughts that I can have either good or bad, the achievements or the losses that I have sometimes. And seeing that a lot of this is constantly in flux and therefore or should not be judged too much. Another way that philosophy has changed my brain is that it's given me access to this adult mental gameplay, which is just so much fun. What I mean by this is that, for example, I think we have this stereotype of children, which is very true, in that they ask a lot of questions and they always say, why, 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 why? And at some point in life, we stopped doing this, but I don't think that instinct ever goes away. I think either we got told off because I remember being told off because my questions were inappropriate or my questions were just too much or they didn't have easy answers or the answers would be problematic. So I was told to hush at some point when we're growing up. And then we realized that some questions are a bit weird and we shut ourselves down. But this instinct of wanting to know what's happening in the world or just asking really big questions of why are we here and why do we need to do any of this or why do we feel a certain way? I feel that deep down we all are genuinely philosophers and this instinct and feeling just never goes away. This fascination with ourselves and the world and people around us and the whole existence of the universe I think is just so essential to who we are as people and realizing that there is a space in the adult world where you can safely do this when you are encouraged to think about literally anything and question anything and you have access to this with so much intellectual adult conversation it's just so much fun. Philosophy has been a space for me as an adult to ask those big why questions that I stopped asking as a child, but I still am just as fascinated by. And although they don't have definite answers, they have quite a few, which are very interesting to explore. Those other discussions tend to be really, really fun. As someone who loves physics, they're very similar to that, but you don't need to know as much maths. So for example, you come up with a theory of how humanity works or how the world works or how systems work. And you come up with this as a formula. And as you would do in physics, which is then you need to test it in various different situations and see if it holds true, you do the same thing in philosophy. You test it in various different groups and various different examples 
examples and see if it works. And then someone else, their job is to kind of play devil's advocate and see why this theory doesn't work or you need to do it for your own theory. And it's just so much fun. Playing devil's advocate is kind of one of my favorite things to do. And I know it's potentially a bit annoying to other people, but I, it comes from a good place, I promise. But it's just so interesting and engaging as adults to have these sort of conversations to test our theories, to see why things work in a very safe, open, free environment where we recognize that nothing matters. We recognize that what we say isn't exactly who we are. We recognize that sometimes we're just saying things because they logically make sense, but we don't need to actually believe them. But we just want to test where our mind goes and how reactions to these things make us feel, which is just so beautiful. So if you can get over the slight pretentiousness of using the word philosophy in general, approaching these sort of books and approaching these sort of conversations is just so, so, so interesting. And I would recommend it to absolutely everyone. I'll link a few books which are my absolute favorite staple philosophy books below and you can actually read the short form kind of condensed versions of them if this video is not sponsored by short form but um, it's a quick way to kind of get the main gist of what these books have to say and see if they are the right fit for you. And on the other hand if you feel as though philosophical books might be a bit too intense for you now another great alternative is to watch the Joys of Chance documentary on Curiosity Stream which are very kindly sponsoring this video. This documentary breaks some approaches to philosophy in a very palatable and easy to understand way as well as kind of ask the questions as to whether fate or chance actually are fundamentals of the universe and how our existence is built around these truths. I would really recommend it as a great first watch into the world of philosophy and there will be a link in my description which will give you a great discount to Curiosity Stream if you want to check it out. Using the link you also get free access to Nebula, a platform where a lot of educational creators like me put our videos up for consumption without ads. So if you want to check that out feel free but otherwise thank you so much for spending this time with me. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Be kind to yourself and others and don't believe everything you think. Thanks. Bye!